Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. So on the show today, the legend that is Judith Aston. So Judith has been in this field for 50 years, far longer than I've been alive. And she is where to start with her CV, really. So there's a whole system called the Aston Paradigm and Aston Kinetics. Uh, she's an inventor. She's the author of several books, including a new one. She's been honoured by various associations of psychology and somatic pioneers. Uh, she knows many of the greats and she's had sessions with Ida Rolf and taught, you know, Rolfing in their program for many years. I don't really know what to say in terms of introducing you because there's so much I could say, Judith, other than really welcome and it's an honour. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's an honour to be here. So I always ask guests, how did you get interested in the body? So um, what was the genesis of your story, Judith? Well, let's see. I guess when I was five, I used to dance around the house as often as I could. And by the time I was seven, um, I think my mother had no other choice than to put me into dance school. And so I did that. And I did that until I was uh, in my teenage years. And then I went to college and um, my subject matters, my skills were math, math, problem solving and um, movement. And somehow, through the regular courses, I ended up taking dance classes into performance. Then I went to UCLA, got my BA and MFA in uh, dance uh, from UCLA. Just in California, and yes. you were dancing and also ended up in the Rolfing School. I'm sure many listeners know of Ida Rolf and that kind of work. Well, what happened there, Mark, was I had a very serious car accident and I really couldn't dance well. I was still teaching, but I had so many compromises and I was asked by Kairos and Esalen at the time to do classes with uh, different leaders. And this leader, this one leader was a psychiatrist who trained with um, um, Fritz Perls. And so I was doing sessions and designing work for him. And I went to him and I said, I don't know, but the hospital says that this is all in my mind. It's not in my mind. I know my body. I'm just so depressed about this. And he said, well, you're in luck, I think, um, because I've heard of a woman, Dr. Ida Rolf, who's coming to Big Sur, and she's like a white witch, and, and she might be able to help you. <laughs> And I ended up on her doorstep. Yeah, I heard you sat on her doorstep, actually sort of waiting to get a lesson. I, I kind of, I heard this story and I just admired the determination of it. I, I wonder, you know, will people start sitting on my doorstep at some point? <laughs> what would I do? You know, like, I think sooner or later I'd let them in and give them a session, you know? So I guess that's what happened, I guess. And sooner or later she got tired of you on the doorstep. And really, I was only waiting for a cancellation. And when she said, when she opened the door after about her third client on the first day of, I sat there two days. Uh, and the first day she said, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm waiting for a cancellation so I could get in for a session. And in that first session, I knew that she understood the magic of the body and that it could uh -huh. change. And that was it. You know, that reminds me of the traditional Japanese way outside the Zen monastery or the martial arts sensei. You have to stand outside their house and wait for them to sort of notice you and invite you in. You know, sometimes you have to stand for a few mornings in the rain before they let you in. That's a sort of traditional thing in Zen schools. To, as oh, well. my goodness. Maybe that's where I got that from in a previous life. Following in the footsteps, maybe, yeah. And so Rolfing, it's known for its strong body work. You know, there's a sort of right way and a wrong way in a lot of Rolfing, and people have to sort And it just doesn't sound like the work you're doing now. It's so something happened in between, you know, getting sessions, becoming, working increasingly with the Rolfing Institute, and what you do now. So what was that? What was that change? Well, what was interesting is Dr. Rolf must have done research on this weird person sitting on her doorstep, so she said to me in the middle of that first session, I understand you design movement programs for people. And I said, I do. And she said, uh, would you be able to design a program for my work? And I said, sure. 
So I'm all happy and ready. And then she said, before I leave, well, I mean, I have to train you. And I said, why? <laughs> and she said, because you have to know the work. And it starts in four weeks. But anyway, what was so astounding to me was as a problem solver, people hire you for a business. You go in, you observe, you come up with some ideas, you present that to the owner. They say, yes, no, on the right track, and you go to the next phase. So when she said she was going to train me into being a body worker, it was like, well, hadn't thought about that, but I did. And then when I designed the movement programs, really starting right when I trained, I was training all the rolfers in how to use their body, how to work without hurting themselves, et cetera. And all these ideas started coming as well as the movement work I designed for her. Um, and what was so fascinating was Dr. Roth taught the work to be done at a right angle going into the tissue in 90 degrees with your knuckles, with your elbow, et cetera, et cetera. And I found that that was compressing the superficial layer to the next layer to the next layer to get to the layer you wanted to work on. So I started training the rolfers to come in at an angle, like a 45 degree angle, so they could go from skin da 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 to get to the layer they wanted to work. And people said, this hurts so much less. So, um, but I think that it was creating some challenge for those, for certain people and so on. And um, yeah. And so I just kept creating until it seemed like uh, I was moving it in a different direction. Uh, so I decided to um, go ahead and just focus on the things that I had in my mind. And I started applying these concepts to many, many different disciplines. And, and the things that had come, the ahas that had come by working with people. And one of the concepts that was so important, Mark, was I teach by contrast meaning even working with babies, I try to set up the evaluation by them so they let me know if they want to continue. So that with adults, I teach them, well, here's the way you're doing it. Here's another way. And they go, oh, well, the other way is so much easier. Why don't we do that? I say, okay, good. I can teach you how to do that. So it just started growing exponentially. And um, I just have trouble stopping myself. <laughs> like stopping yourself learning, stopping yourself. Because it seems like you're a real kind of um, lifelong learner. You know, it seems like you're yeah. like, from the research I've done, I, I don't know your work well, so excuse any ignorance in this interview. I've not had a chance to get to you, like, you know, personally. But it seems like every few years you're bringing new things in, you're developing, you're studying with different people. You know, you didn't just study with Ida Rolf and stay there and say, right, now I'm a classic rolfer and then do that for the next 50 years. I love it. I have many people who do rolfing uh, to do structural integration come to my classes. And I just love when they say one something while they're talking and I go, oh, I remember when that idea came. <laughs> like that idea about sitting forward on the seat, you know. Um, the thing is, when you sit back on the seat and you have the thighs on the same alignment uh, level as the ischial tuberosities, it rolls the posterior, the, the pelvis into a posterior tilt, which takes the chest into a slump. So if you're working at the computer, uh -huh. I mean, it changes everything. So I love that people use these ideas and apply them to many things, but I apply them to, for people who sing, people who play music, people who work at the desk, people who do surgery, et cetera, et cetera. And there was this sort of set idea that everything had to be kind of blocks that were, you know, there's the, the classic picture of the, the human being with the blocks that are all kind of lined up. And this sort of corrective model of, well, that's not a very good pelvis or, you know, things have, you, your head should be in this place. Exactly, exactly. Um, and I taught that because yeah. I taught that it was correct to be in the perpendicular line to the earth and that things happened at 90 degrees often and that we were trying to correct the posture and suddenly you know these aha moments where like you're looking at something and then like a puzzle it cracks into all these pieces and you say wait a minute I have to look at this differently because 
What if we have to match what is first to unhook it from its holding and its connection to all the rest of the body, mind, spirit? What if we have to do that? And then that led into a whole other. And there's this awkward, and I had this with Aikido, it was my sort of first love as an art years ago. And there's this awkward moment where one, me, you, is doing something and we go, okay, there's this orthodoxy truth here that I'm committed to because I'm teaching this. I've developed maybe years for this. I have relationships with human beings who I, you know, don't want to let down and don't want to argue with. And I have this set of social pressures, economic pressures. I make my living maybe from this. And then it, then there's the truth or the tr- next truth that we see. And it's, there's this decision point. And I think most human beings go, let's just stay with what I know and the, you know, the social pressures. And there's this move of going, you know what, even though it might cost me money or friends or status, or I might get mocked, I, I'm drawn to this. This no longer seems the most true thing. And that I, I wonder about that point and how people make that, that decision. You know, was that just an obvious decision to you when that started coming up? Was it painful? Was it, you know, what's, what was your process in that? In a way, it, I still loved what I was doing and developing, and I had no idea that, uh, well, I mean, I had an idea that in some cases it created um, a challenge for people because it was a slightly different way of looking at the body. Uh, way back, on, we're talking in the late 60s and 70s. Um, but what really happened for me is there was a magazine article that uh, said Judith Aston has created soft rolfing. And then it talked about certain things that I had discovered. And I never was interviewed for that magazine. I have no idea how that article came about. But it was kind of the definitive place of, wait a minute, you're advertising this. And I said, no, I don't know. But anyway, it was a good time for me to to see that I had to follow the creative. I mean, here's a big one. Here's a very, very big one. So when I had this aha moment, a couple of aha moments, and these are just earth shaking to me, and I'm sure you know what I'm talking about from your own experience. So I'm going along and it's like, I can hear people saying, well, you're so asymmetrical and your body is asymmetrical and and da 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 And it's like, I had this aha. It's like, I don't think I've ever met an asymmetrical body. Right. So right. that makes me curious. And then number two, I was still teaching and I would walk into a class of 20 people. And as soon as I would open the door, Mark, they would go like this. Yep. Yeah, yep. so they correct themselves based on what correct mental themselves. idea of what they should do. And this, so this one day, because I love humor and I love, I guess I'm a trickster. And so I said, class, I'm so sorry. I forgot something in my car. I'll be right back. I closed the door, counted two seconds, op- opened it again. And there they were in that posture. And I couldn't believe it. I said, you guys, something is wrong if you think good posture is this kind of stress or you're trying to impress me. So let's... We've got to stop this. And so that was a big motivation. And then in another class, I looked at the plumb line coming down correctly from the ear to the malleolus. And I said, you know, that only divides the foot in two thirds. It's only the front of the malleolus to the heel. Do we not need a forefoot? And so it was like, we need a forefoot. <laughs> we need the whole foot because it's the, the length of the foot supports the depth of the body and the width of each foot supports the width of the right and left and the height of the arch and the foot supports the length of the body. So these were things that came out as principles right away. And then I had to figure out what that meant. It was like... Right. So let me take this. This is so, this is so rich. So... And this is human urge to impose kind of platonic ideals on nature. 
so it seems to be in our character you know we like mathematics we like the equilateral triangle because it's you know we you never see a perfect equilateral triangle walking in the woods for example right but we like this idea of simplicity and Iyengar would draw straight lines on photos of the body and there aren't any straight lines in the body you know, it's all curves and spirals, even something that looks straight like a shin bone has, has a general yeah. curve to it. And there seems to be an urge to sort of impose that. And it comes from very much like a mental image, but it doesn't work. People can sit for a little while and maybe they're sort of forcing themselves through the discipline, but it's so much effort that it's going to sooner or later, you'll see this on a meditation retreat, you know, day one, everyone's sitting in a certain way and they have to have found a more natural posture by day three because it's just exhausting. And maybe they do it when the sensei walks by or the authority figure teacher, but it's not sustainable. So what's an alternative to imposing a model mentally? What's an alternative to that, that kind of approach? Yes. Um, again, I used to teach that. <laughs> um, and also, I think parents sometimes use that um, in terms of just the voice and the, the um, which means stop. And, and the children stop what they're doing. They freeze kind of thing. But when you think of the number of asymmetries in the body, meaning anything you do with your right hand, it doesn't automatically come easily to the left. Um, that injury you had, that fall that created scar tissue, that creates an impression uh, and some kind of maybe shortness or uh, some kind of vector from scar tissue. There's all this asymmetry and asymmetry in motion creates spirals. And the object is to teach people how to utilize those spirals to rehydrate and keep the body juicy through their daily breathing and exercise and walking and thinking. Um, and interestingly enough, when we match these spirals or these in isolation scar tissue holdings, they get juiced up by the honoring of the vectors in there and the causes of those vectors by matching it and they unravel. So it's a way of teaching people to do their own body work, actually, I find, and that is of particular interest to me. Um, but anyway, so these asymmetrical spirals um, really allow us to have two sides to the body and an upper and a lower that are quite different. And the way that we use them can be liberating. As you say, like almost nobody, well, we don't, nobody does. We have a liver on one side, a stomach on the other, the heart slightly larger on one side. Very few people are ambidextrous. I mean, this should sort of be obvious, really, that we're, we are asymmetrical creatures in, in, our, in our biology, let alone in our usage, right? Right, mm. right. Sometimes I play tricks on yoga teachers. We'll do a pose just on one side, and then I'll move on to a second pose. And it's, and, and this, this, and they just freak out. <laughs> Yeah, see, that's the trickster energy, but it's also useful as a lesson. Because <laughs> I'm like, look, it's not like, for example, I'm drinking a cup of coffee. I'm not picking it up with my right hand, then picking it up with the left hand, right? I'm using my right hand to drink this coffee. And, you know, also my setup. So I've got my microphone to one side. So it may be over, you know, a few hundred interviews, I start leaning a bit more this way, right? Or, you know, there's this different patterns. And then when the light comes in my room in a certain way, it's going to lead to different well, things. Well, and you bring up such a good point because... The leaning, because your desk, your computer's here, your, your phone is on the left, but your other thing that you need to write on is to the right. Let's just say you already have a pattern of leaning and side bending to the right. So the longer you do that without neutralizing it, changing things around and changing your vision pattern, you now are determining what your correction for your glasses are going to have to be. It's no longer just what you were born with as it grows. It's all these other factors. So learning to neutralize um, and the right, teach the left, and all of that is just so important. I'm so glad you brought that up. In your work that I've seen, tell me if I'm wrong, I know you've invented various kinds of sort of devices and different things for posture. That's quite unusual. Most embodiment teachers, somatics teachers are obsessed with the inner world because it's fascinating. You know, it is fascinating once you open that up. Um, however, as you say, 
our physical environment, the chairs we use, the computers we use, is making a huge difference. You know, like I will very rarely use a laptop because I don't want to spend my time looking down. Right? I was doing a breathing class today, a yoga class with breathing, and I was using my laptop because I wanted to be in the other room and I rarely use it. And at the end of the class, I had a sore neck and I thought I must have been in the class. And I went, oh no, it's I've been looking at the computer for the whole class and I'm, I'm, I have quite a big screen. So I'm used to looking almost straight ahead. Um, so this does make quite a huge difference to how we're shaping ourselves, right? Exactly. Exactly. We shape ourselves and that changes the chemistry as well. I'm sure it changes how our organs function. Um, the compression, you know what, Mark, you could help me. I want to start a world movement. <laughs> I'm going to start a world movement to get people to supinate. Um, so most of our life is pronation, which is the hands rolling down. So that's the way we do the computer, the way we drive a car, the way we wash our dishes, et cetera, et cetera, the way we comb our hair. Everything is in pronation. Mm -hmm. The pronation suggests that the chest go back and down yep. and the shoulders yep. elevate and so on and so forth. And people are aging so quickly. Uh-huh. The seats do that, the car seats do that, which is why I had to get into the ergonomics of products because the car seat, people who drive for a living, it was like, oh my goodness. Uh, and I, it was so funny because, oh, let's see what, but this would probably be 1980, 78 or something like that. And I'm walking out, I asked this client if I could walk out to the car with him and I grabbed my foam and some duct tape and a pair of scissors. And we're walking out to the car. And he says, excuse me, why are you carrying those things? And I said, oh, I can modify your car seat for your new body. <laughs> and he said, you're not modifying my new Jaguar. <laughs> and I said, okay. <laughs> he said, I will send my upholsterer to you. And I said, very well. That's good. Fine. Thank you. And I left and I thought, no, no, now is the time. I have to get these in hard products that people can just select what they need for their car, a little seat or a little back or a little knee pillow so that you're not always holding and tightening the hip flexors and the adductors going from the brake to the accelerator, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, so it's math. So when you can teach people to supinate as you do in yoga, but to emphasize the importance of that and that the other piece that became so important to me was I just couldn't understand why we needed to fight gravity. And it had been so prevalent in the 1800s, 1900s, coming from Europe, these ideas about how you stand up against gravity and you fight against gravity and so on and so forth. And you reach up with your head and you reach for the sky hook. And as a young dancer, we were taught to reach. So it's like, suddenly, <laughs> I just started playing with what I'd learned as a dancer as the mm -hmm. push off. If you're going to jump, you have to push off the earth. Mm -hmm. So I started pushing off. And so, you know, in Aikido, you're not just doing the upper body. You're always using the vectors of the floor, the mat, the this, your arm, et cetera, et cetera. And so... Uh, it was probably in 88 or 89, um, I think. Anyway, this woman was the head of the physical therapy department in, um, at the University of Washington, and she was taking classes with me. And she said, Judith, I just need to tell you that that thing that you think is so special that you call the push-off does have a name. It's I, called ground reaction force. In physics. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, oh, I'm so excited. But what I noticed when I read about it in books and so on is that people used it with their contact point, but they didn't reuse it for each different joint if they needed to, to get all the way up to screw in the light bulb. It was just one contact of the floor. So I teach a lot of empowering people to massage their body all day long by the way they play between gravity and ground reaction in all the angles. Wow, there's just so much in what you're saying. I mean, the it's interesting just to go back to the Jaguar example that we, we people think of their physical possessions as very, you know, 
you can't change my table or my chair, let alone my Jaguar, you know, that, that that's more important somehow than our body. And also that they come in pretty regimented sizes and shapes, you know, like um, there's a few adjustable things on my chair, for example, that help. But my, my, my mental Paul Linden sometimes says t- uh, chairs are tools of political oppression. And he's kind of half joking because he's, he's, he's in the way it's which they've sort of one size is supposed to fit all these different human beings who are there uh, and be permanently like that for you know your whole life as it were as opposed to going how what do I need now how do I play with that and as you say how do I move between all the different parts of my life rather than I have to get the perfect sitting posture or standing posture or whatever your horse riding posture and stay there but again we seem to be moving creatures more than more than um like architectural creatures yeah, yeah, yes, indeed, indeed. And where did your, where did your, tell us more about how your work developed then, like what did you bring in, what else inspired you, tell us about some of the influences that came in and how, how they um, are live now. Well, in 1976, um, I had this observation that all these people who were getting this body work around all these places that I was traveling and teaching, I couldn't see the movement go through the skeleton and out the other side. I could see the movement go to run into the abutment of the skeleton, say in the legs. So maybe the periosteum or something, but I didn't see it go through and I thought, I need to figure out how to get to the deepest layers of the body so we could work with them. And so I created this, I was working with a physician and I was trying this out on him and he said, oh my goodness, well, that's incredible. And I can certainly feel the changes. And I said, so what would I call working with the joints? But I should have said, all along the bone as well, but the joints. He said, well, arthro is the word for joints. I said, okay. So I called it arthrokinetics. And I started training people in 77. And it's a way of listening, of course, but being able to feel the path of action so that, so Mark, if you tell me to reach something up here and it's supposed to go like that, but I've had a shoulder injury And really, as I start to reach, I'm going to have to flex to get my arm up to reach because it doesn't go that way. But what I began as I was playing with this arthrokinetics and developing in those next few years, I saw that all movement could be matched. So I would teach someone to internally rotate, side bend, flex forward, push off their feet, lift their arm, and get to the light bulb. And they'd say, it didn't hurt. I'm... I'm able to do that movement. And then as they did it more and more, they didn't have to go like that. They'd only have to internally rotate a little bit. And eventually, if they came for body work, they could help neutralize it even more. So it was one of those significant discoveries to working with the myofascial. So then I applied it to the myofascial work of how do you go into the layer at a tempo in the layer in a circuitous route to get to a deep layer to work on the holding patterns. And then that led me to this idea of holding patterns. Well, there are two, at least two kinds of holding patterns in different ways. One is a structural in the tissue, and the other is functional. It could be through the mind of of fear. It could be through uh, the function of, um, it's the way I feel about my breathing, or I don't want to have my chest be up. I I did a session with a woman who was very much in the Polynesian uh, community and her chest was very much here. And I suggested that as we play with her, her chest would come maybe to here. And she thought I was talking about here. She said it doesn't show humility. Uh huh. There's cultural factors around posture, isn't there? That you can't just ignore those. Yeah. Yes. And so it's just teaching people how to honor what is find out how it's held, go in, match it, listen, and see what path of action it tells you to come out or to go back in again, and so on and so forth. And this started changing everything. 
the third body work was uh, the arthrokinetics and myokinetics. And then the third body work was a massage form that if I could teach people how to spiral from the skin, because sometimes it starts really in the, the direction of the skin to match the next layer to the fluid layer, to da -da 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 -da, it might change many different directions. To do the massage form, I would see people at the end of that session who make so much more change than any of the specific work I had ever done. So I started using that first and training people in that, and that was in the 80s, late 80s. So quick interruption to let you know about some of the stuff we're doing outside the podcast. So the Body Facilitator course and the uh, Foundations of Embodiment Certification, they're now running, so you can't get on those until next year. Uh, this year, if you're a yoga teacher, you can get on the Embodiment uh, Body Yoga Principles online teacher training, which is eyp.training. And the main one, I would say, is to go to embodiedfacilitator.com and get on our newsletter list. Uh, then you'll hear about all the free events we do. We do free events regularly use certain free ebooks uh, the podcast itself is there all the videos all the stuff we do related to the content on this on the show if you want as i said ebooks books free trainings we do things regularly on marketing on trauma on uh, facilitation generally that's all there so go to embodiedfacilitator.com and have a look around there and get on the newsletter list so you hear about you know the different trainings and things we have happening thank you and back to the show So I've just about been born. That's, uh, that, I mean, I'm joking a little bit about the age thing here, but Judith, it's a slightly rude question, but can I ask how old you are now? Well, I will have my 79th birthday in August. <laughs> wow. Wow. I mean, podcast listeners can't see this, but go over to the YouTube channel. Judith, if you mind me saying, you move, there's a risk of being a little bit charming here. Like someone, I know people in their 50s who, do movement practice regularly and don't move with the grace and ease that you do all that the kind of vibrancy and youthfulness so i mean i guess one way into this really is just to say what's the secret to that judith i'd love to be moving like you when i'm 79 what, what's what's is it just years of work like what what no, what is it it doesn't take years of work but because i live this way it is a way of rehydrating the body because I've had some very, very, very serious accidents. I mean, I was skiing with uh, an inventor and I got uh, interested because I'm an inventor and he came to my inventor society and presented and it was a ski with ball bearings in gel. And I thought, he said, you can dance down the mountain with this. And I said, that's the ski for me. But we didn't know and he actually didn't know that he hadn't figured out the right adjustment of the binding to go with that kind of velocity when the ski was out of control. And so I went to, I was up in the air and I heard a sound. And so I tried to move my leg uh, in the air and it went 180 degrees and snapped the tibial plateau across. Off. Uh, and when I landed because of the torsion, the tibial plateau broke the tibia, came out my leg, crushed my knee and they removed it from my, Ilium. That was one. And I've had another serious one in my left ankle, and then I broke my left knee. Had a car um, crash as well, right? I heard you had a fairly yeah, serious yeah, car crash. Yeah. Crashes. And so the thing that I love about teaching and teaching and training our practitioners, people come from many different areas of focus, and nurses and chiropractors and yoga teachers and Pilates teachers, that there I have this belief that there is always a way that you can neutralize. And so uh, I, mentioned, I mentioned this because the medical equipment that you're given when you're recovering sets in a pattern of symmetry and compromise because you don't move. You don't move that way. So therefore, you know, so, uh, so immediately I had the crutches and I put a shoe on the side that was normal so that I could have my right leg at least swing through the face. And suddenly I was walking better. And then I 
looked at my I looked at a tr- my treadmill and I said, you know, I could use the conveyor belt to slide my leg on laterally, and then if I turn, I could do it medially, and I could do it posteriorly, and I could do it without any weight bearing. I'm just having the conveyor belt. Well, and that turned into this thing I call treadmill dancing, which I do for exercise. But um, it's just this, I've not been able to get away from the math and the creative inventor in me since I was a child. I used to to do all of these things. And when I was 14, I was hired for my skill set at what I called my FEB. My goal is to help you to do something faster, easier, or better. <laughs> and, and that's, I mean, that's what I mean, because you're fast. Like, you're, I've, I've got a lot of great Aikido senseis I know who are, you know, late 70s, but, and, you know, they're, they're, I'm, I'm not patronizing to old people here. Like, they're, they're people in good shape, you know? But it's, 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 you're fast and vibrant as well as easier and smoother than almost anyone I know I've ever had on the show. So it's, um, I, this has really made me curious. Had we just been doing audio, I don't think I would have had quite such a, you know, it's quite such an impression. I'm so glad you let, uh, left the video on um, because I love talking and seeing you and interacting with you. And so when when um, I heard it was just going to be audio, which is fine for the podcast, but I just meant, I, I just am so glad to see you and interact. That's great. Um, there's there's just, um, oh, it, it, it's just infinite. Um, and I really am trying to figure out how to pass along so many things I haven't had a chance to teach yet. What would you say was your calling, Judith? Like if someone said you've had this rich career, all these different things, systems, inventions, you know, if someone said to you, what was, what was your calling? What's been your calling in these 50 years? What would you say? To be of service. Beautiful. To be of service. Yeah. And do you just kind of go, how can I do that in the many ways that I know? Well, and I'm always surprised by a new situation. I mean, how people have these unique, different things going on with their body that really what we're made up of is always able to change. That's the thing. So if you use your body in the same way and you sit in the same chair that compromises you and you work all day like that without neutralizing, then, or I can teach you a way of doing it, or I can design a computer for you, definitely the keyboard so that it works better for you. But it's just so, um, it's just so exciting. Mm. Mm. And you seem to have that real excitement for the work. You know, I saw an interview of you about 15 years ago, same thing, same very similar sort of vibe from today. What keeps that vibrancy, that excitement? Curiosity and, again, to assist someone. I uh, I mean, um, for example, I, I had the very special opportunity to work with a a very, very special spiritual man in Hawaii. And he had been in the Vietnam War and had many compromises. And I watched him walk away from me one day with his cane and all of this tremendous jerking that every step required him to do. And I said, I caught up with him and I said, may I? offered to work with you. And he said, of course. I worked with him and his tissue was able to change, but his feet were uh, fused. So much of the ankle in the ankle to the tibia on one leg was fused. So I started pulling in uh, a hand towel and, uh, and folding it to give him height to the shorter leg and, and a washcloth under the ball of the foot and da 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 and then I got a hold of a, um, a place that makes shoes in, by UCLA. And I got the shoes delivered to me. And I said, what are you? These are not what I designed. And they said, well, we could see from the photograph that he didn't need that. You have it all wrong. 
So I had to go to Hawaii, take the shoes, have a shoemaker help me, da, da, da. He stood on them and he said, oh my, this is the first time I've stood on two feet underneath my hips in 25 years. So, it's, sat- it's satisfying, isn't it? Moments like that, very. <sighs> so the physical side of things, you're definitely, you know, real expert, at, expert in, you've got huge experience in this. Say a bit more about how this interacts with the kind of psychosocial side, because I, you're not just changing someone's posture or gait or physical comfort. There's way more going on here. So could you say a little bit more about the, the wider implications of this work? Well, that's interesting because before I met Dr. Rolf, um, I was hired by Kairos to create movement for these leaders, Fritz Sperls, people that would come down from SLN and so on and do these workshops in La, Ho- in La Jolla <clears throat> at Kairos. And this one psychiatrist, he was trained by Fritz. He was also a surgeon, the one who told me about the white witch I'd roll. Anyway, and um, he would be working with people and you call it the hot seat. I think you probably know that. And um, and there'd be a group of 20 people observing and they'd be doing like this. They'd be elbowing people and commenting and doing these, you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it's all in the trouble is with her father. You can see that kind of thing mumbling in the back and so on. And so I realized and I thought, I wonder if the person in the hot seat, if I created a third chair for them to sit as an observer, what would they see? So I'd start, what do you see in the body in front of you? Well, she looks very uptight, kind of stiff. Uh Uh-huh. And so on and so forth. And so it was like, wow, if we can take a look at ourselves, not from someone who is criticizing us, and not from us just criticizing ourselves, but to get a different 360 by 360. I have to tell people sometimes, they say, well, it's a 360 model. I say... Well, I know I'm interested in a 360 by 360. And they so you mean like an MRI? And I said, if you've looked at an MRI, it only has two planes that it can show at a time. No, no, I'm talking to learn to see the body in 360 by 360. And you will be able to see the emotion hit the body immediately with that one word that one person said to them. You see it. And they may think that they're able to hide it, but it just influenced the whole field. So it just, um, I did quite a, I, let's see, probably five years of work there in, the, in that realm. And uh, I'm always working with the, the consequence of the emotion in a session. And our, many of our practitioners come with training in those fields. Um, it's so important to be able to enable a change in the body, mind, heart. I mean, in the body, excuse me, the heart and the head and be able to facilitate one to own it, you know, in their body, bit by bit, not take someone who's who's here sitting during the session and tell them, I saw at one of those workshops, I was horrified when one of these famous leaders had this very timid Asian woman in front of the room, and she was kind of doing this kind of thing. He said, I want you to stand with your feet way apart and your arms open and your chest sticking yeah. out. Yeah. Show, us, show us your genitals or something. I mean, something really offensive. It was, you are not helping. You are creating another holding pattern, another wound. And it should just bounce back, right? Like the same thing with the rolfing work. It's the same thing emotionally. There's going to be a bounce back by pushing someone way too extreme to something that's just far too much for them to be comfortably be present with. You know, that there, there, there are many, many people now that are doing the raw thing that, um, that has changed through the years as the theories have come out there and the science has come out there and so on and so forth so that they're working to listen to these things that you and I are talking about. But back in the day, in the 60s, it was life-changing, but it was, you had to be hardy. Yeah, there was, a, I hear stories now and think, wow, people would be sued for doing that now. Some of the stories I hear from Fritz Perls or Feldenkrais or Ida Rolf, any of these sort of great names, it seemed to be a sort of lacking of kindness or just a lacking of sometimes like, civility even at times. I go, 
ah, it's, it's hard because we owe a great debt to a lot of these people in terms of the work they've brought, but I'm, I'm glad things have got a little bit kinder. Well, you know, it's interesting because there are so many businesses out there where people really are there to help you. But for example, if I'm sitting in a chair that puts me rolling my pelvis back and they tell me to push my head against this thing for them to evaluate my vision, I do it one second. I go, oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I forgot something. And I'll take my jacket. I put under my pelvis. So I just sit mm-hmm. here and I say, I have things going on with my neck. Could you please bring this equipment to me? And I know that I improve visually. So at least they're going to test me accurately. Mm-hmm. But they, they have the greatest good in, as an intention. It's just that the way things are done. And that isn't necessarily obvious to someone, is it, that one's posture for sitting will impact your vision, let alone your emotional sense or, you know, social roles or the kind of some of those things. I am looking at this um, email that your colleague Courtney sent me that your work really covers so much ground. It seems like one of the broadest you know, like I'm just going to read this out, body work, fitness forms, facial fitness. I don't want to hear about that. Aston patterning for yoga and for Pilates. So there's applications there, senior fitness, ergonomics, applications to music, pregnancy, sports, uh, self-care component. I definitely want to hear about that. There's just, and I've only got to three out of a list of six, I think that she sent me as sort of basic areas to potentially ask you about. Like it's so broad. Well, they come because of the need. And so um, in 1985, one of my students, uh, one of our practitioners, uh, lost her mother. And I watched her in one week age at least 10 years. The despair, uh, the sadness, the ache, because this woman, her mother was not expected. She was healthy and just, I don't know whether it was an accident. I don't know what happened. But it was immediate, and I watched her, and I, my heart went out, and I went, I've got to figure this out. So, um, okay, all right. So I started playing with it with myself and so on and so forth, and, and then I remember that someone gave me a book on facial toning when I was 21 years old, and I said, huh, I don't really think I, that I, I need that book, but I found it. And I see that they do all these exercises, but again, I don't know. It would be like doing um, one of the asana, uh, you know, the the reaching with the tongue, only doing it from a collapsed position. Right. Tone your face in this collapsed position. And I thought, well, if you're in neutral, then if you tone your face, it's going to be going in the right direction. So I created this thing of working, using all of my skills to do the massage form to lift, to rehydrate, to circulate, and then doing isometrics myself, creating a resistance that she could work against, and then to work with the uh, the lymphatic drainage, and then to work with the whole body to support it, and so on. And I watched her in that one session become herself. And she looked in the mirror and said, well, there I am. And it was like, so she trained in it. <laughs> And became part of my first training class on how to help people with facial fitness. Wonderful, wonderful. What about the self-care side of things? This is something that's come into um, into light recently. People are, you know, with the COVID lockdown, self-care's got more publicity. It seems to be a positive thing that people are leaning towards this. So, um, yeah, what's your contribution to that area? Yes, uh, well, I do, we've done... Um, these sessions one-to-ones for years. I've done them for five years on Zoom with clients and I can help them work on themselves, but also um, I can teach them movement to do or an exercise to do or what have you. So that's worked very well. I'm starting to do classes now. That's a bit more challenging because I like to see the bodies and how they interpret what I'm saying. And it was so cute the other day, I was doing a class in Hawaii and the woman said, um, one of the women yelled out, Less talking, just keep moving. (laughs) I was trying to explain why you would do this a certain way. And uh, she was obviously not doing it in the way she was ricocheting her body all over. Um, But I did get that feedback. So I thought, well, next time I have to change what I present. But the piece there is that you can teach an ergonomics lesson easily. You can teach lifting your child, lowering your child into the, the, at night into their bed. Um, You can teach your child about how to support them as they're starting to walk. Um, 
you can teach all of these skills as well as the fitness forms. I found out, I wonder if this overview is too much, but anyway, you, you're asking, so I'll just. I'm curious. So as much as anything, I'm just trying to find stuff out. <laughs> Well, I feel that you have to decompress the body before you start toning. So I created a form called loosening. And there's horizontal loosening, there's vertical loosening, and how you get your body to gap the joints to their more normal place rather than just continuing to exercise over the compression of your long run yesterday. So you decompress first, then you tone. You tone in the new length, the new body to do your exercise. And then you can stretch in a way that doesn't um, borrow from another place. So for example, even something as simple as uh, wanting to stretch from the foot all the way up through the body. A lot of people will go like that. So instead they've compressed their back, uh, uh, yeah. compressed, compressed the back of the hip joint, so stretched beyond neutral, the front of the hip flexors, et cetera. So there are ways of doing it. this is what, and that's, Learning all of that, uh, those were in the 90s that I started training people. That applied to yoga and Pilates. I've done that for years and years. So you, you combine the principles we've been talking about with people's existing yoga practice. So it's in that case, to make sure their back bend is, is extensive and not compressive. Yeah. So if they have trouble with their ankles, there's a certain way that you set up. For example, uh, do you have something like a shoe or something that you could just hold? Or a water bottle. Uh, yeah, I've got a water bottle. Okay. okay, sitting on the edge of your chair. Okay, now, throw it up and catch it with two hands. Got it? Hold on to it. Okay. Got it? So now, check your range of motion. Feel what you've got available in your joints, your shoulders. Got it? Scoot to the front of the seat. Hold the bottom of it with your one hand. Go to your left to push off your, uh, about half that distance. Lean a little bit, push off your left foot and place your left hand around the bottle. Mm -hmm. Hold it. Leave it there. Go to your right foot, push your right foot, place your right hand around the bottle. Come to the middle and check your range of motion. It's bigger. Yeah. Now go back to the first one where you're sitting back in the chair and you do it, catch it, check your range of motion. Yep, definitely a difference. So I learned that really any setup we do, do needs to be one side and then the other. And you need to be able to really use the earth to set that up. Yeah. Have you seen a difference in teaching over the years, like how students have changed or, you know, how is it, is it the same as it was in the seventies to teach or is this, this? No, no. What's, 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 what's the difference? Concentration spans I've heard from other teachers or. <laughs> well, there's so much information out there these days and people are so used to getting it quickly. Mm. Uh, and cognitive recognition is um, an excellent trait to have, but to embody it um, and own it, it often takes time. And sometimes it takes people, some people, much more time before they even get the aha. They just have to work with it a while. So I, I feel the impatience these years. Mm -hmm. uh, one would think I have more impatience because of my time, <laughs> my age and the time, but, <laughs> but some things just take time to learn. Um, but anyway, um, it's quite different. In the 70s and 80s, people were really, they came, the training is long, or some of our trainings are only a few days, two, two, three, four, five days. But some of them are 10 days, twice a year, for three mm -hmm. years or something. You know, so it just depends. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. And you notice that too, Mark. Oh, I haven't been teaching long, as, as long, you know, I've been teaching, well, the first thing I taught, maybe 20 years. I have seen a change in concentration spans um, and almost like a kind of consumer demand culture come a little bit into a little bit entitled consumer kind of vibe. And I, I you know, I 
grew up really with sort of respect for teachers and senseis and uh, it wasn't like you were shopping when you went to see a semantics or embodiment teacher and it now it has that quality of someone's like entertain me or i've bought your services so you're a consumer item is kind of how i feel not with everyone but we have to like almost reset that on courses and it's definitely harder and harder to get time you know like a week-long training now might as well be 10 years in tibet you know so it's uh <laughs> you know even at business training this has happened i heard that um it's a business college in 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 uh in near london that you know back in the 50s they used to do uh a month-long course and they have no month-long courses now that was the standard for a managerial course back in the 50s and it was they lost about a week every decade you know so now it's they get managers for two days they like they feel lucky maybe we can get our doctors in something for a week a month-long course we'll have to look into this <laughs> Yeah, now it's uh, maybe there'll be a change after this whole COVID thing. We'll see, but um, that impatience, that speed, maybe has comes to a head. What, what's your lead edge, Judith? Maybe as we move towards the close here, is there something you're particularly interested in right now, or that's very juicy for you? Supination. Okay. <laughs> Definitely supination. That people use it to neutralize all the pronation in the world activities. Um, you know, I have so many things on the list to to get to um, in terms of training. So I, I'm trying to figure that out right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Still things you're curious about learning. Mm -hmm. Well, Judith, if we must move towards a close here, um, where do people find out more about your work? Where's the best place to go online? You know, our website is astinkinetics.com. Uh -huh. And our email is office at astinkinetics.com. And that would be great. I am um, starting to do a few classes online, free classes. Oh, great. Uh, so people can join, and they just have to call and register. Uh, I mean, email and register. And um, and then we're, we're moving toward um, facilitating our practitioners to have a forum to assist people as well and and for people to be able to go to our website and see the different practitioners and what they specialize in so that they could have a little short session or lesson or something like that um, and do sessions online because that is the way of the times. So that's Aston, A-S-T-O-N, Kinetics. Could you spell Kinetics? I want to make sure I get the right one. I was looking at it earlier. K-I-N. E-T-I-C-S. There it is. Great. And I saw some other videos and other things on there. It's nicely put together. site. some of the products we've been talking about. And um, yeah, I think it's all right with you, Judith. I'd love to use the video for this as well. Sometimes we only use the audio, but this has just been just to sort of see your vibrancy. It's been so lovely. And I'd really recommend listeners go to the YouTube channel to check this one out if, if you're okay with that. I am. You're going to edit out a few places with us. Yeah, we can. It will be a free editing process, but actually, it was very smooth. So, um, do you, go on. Uh, I guess we need to wrap up here. Do you have a kind of closing message or anything you'd like to say to to finish it? Well, I thank you for your interest and the opportunity. I love this work. I love teaching people this work. Clients and children and people, practitioners. Yes, yes, yes. But the ideas uh, are so useful. And it takes us out of this paradigm that has been so prevalent about the math of the body and how it's supposed to function. And it really is full of spirals and asymmetries. And, and actually, there are just ways to give our body guidance to facilitate its best body. So being in your best body for now is always my interest. Judith, it's been a, a pleasure, delight even, and an honour. So um, I'll see you at the Embodiment Conference. Uh, I think this will... I lo would love everyone to know about your work. I, I, this is a strange situation now with the internet that some people are discovering somatics in this whole world and they say, who's Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen or who's Judith Aston? And I say, seriously, seriously. So uh, I'm really glad that we're, we're getting this out to, uh, to another generation and um, putting it out far and wide. I wanted to tell you because uh, I was hired, um, I got a grant to work with the Berkeley rowing crew um, that had done so well that they were going to the Henley Brigada. So I got to come to the Henley Brigada and on the way from London to there, I 
the bus went through Aston. Aston is near Birmingham in the centre of England, and there's a part of as well. There's a couple of Astons in the UK, so I'm wondering if that's where you, your family came from originally. Yeah, I think it is. It, it's it's uh, several people have started, and yes, it seems pretty much so. There we are. We're connected in another way, Mark. <laughs> well, it was a real pleasure. So thank you, Judith. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. some ways to uh, get more to give back and to get more involved now so um the biggest request i have would be to share the podcast with your friends people that you think would really enjoy it um email it to them put it on your social media tell them about it old school um yeah really appreciate that equally if you want to support us financially you can go to patreon that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash embodiment podcast and give us a dollar an episode and i'd say they're well worth a dollar so um that's less than a pound if you're in UK-ish. So yeah, please go there. Um, on the embodyfacilitator.com website is where this is hosted. If you're, most people I think listen to for iTunes. Um, iTunes, we'd certainly appreciate a review. The way iTunes works means that a review means more people will find it. iTunes regards it as more important for searches. So even a couple of sentences review really does help as a little thank you to us. And if you want to go to embodyfacilitator.com, you can see the actual you know links to the sites. There's comments on there um the facebook group tends to be where people discuss things so if you go to uh, put in the embodiment podcast into facebook there's a page which is relatively quiet and a group which does have some discussion on so um yeah i will reply to things personally there so um also on embodiedfacilitator.com website uh, there's all sorts of freebies there. There's videos, there's free ebooks, there's ebooks you can buy. And of course, there's our newsletter list. If you want to stay in touch and learn about things like the Embodied Facilitator course and our, um, you know, our next Embodied Yoga Principles teacher training, then go to that website and you'll see a little pop up and you can um, get the newsletter through there. Okay, so I think they're the main ones. Tell your friends, pay us some money on Patreon, give us a review on iTunes. Uh, send us your email if you want to be on the newsletter list and get involved on the Facebook there a bit long uh, pick whatever you like that works for you mm-hmm.